Today's scripture comes from the book of Acts of the Apostles, the 17th chapter, verses 22 through 31. Let's listen. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So ends the reading of the word.
It has been an intense week in the life of First Christian Church as such a wonderful staff and a wonderful complement of dozens of volunteers helped prepare and then host the funeral service yesterday for Dominic Cerna, 22-year-old son of our ministry assistant, Diana Cerna, and her husband, Bill. It has been an intense week, and I'm very, very grateful to the staff and to the literally dozens of volunteers who put in hours and hours. And one of the things that I am grateful for this morning is that in the midst of a week in which I have spent probably 20 hours or so with the Cerna family that our senior pastor emeritus Gay Hatler offered to preach this morning, and I took him up on it. And so I'm very grateful to Gay for his sensitivity and for be his willingness to preach today. I have minister colleagues around the country who are incredulous and don't believe the kind of relationship that I have with my predecessor. And it is a joy, it is a gift, and I have always delighted in Gay's support and know that he is such an asset to me and our congregation. So Gay, welcome back to our Good Sunday morning to you on this Sunday following the third winter we've had this year. Um, <clears throat> what do you think of when you th hear the word chain smokers? First service, Ch Chris said, and that's correct. That's one thing about that is a reference to chain smokers. But for these, and maybe for some of you, it's also the reference to a music group called the Chainsmokers. It's um, two guys, Andrew Taggart and, Taggart and Alex Paul. They've had a number of top 10 hits across the last few years. In 2014, they had a top 20 single in several countries uh, with the song Selfie. It reached number 16 on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100, number 3 in Australia, and number 11 in the United Kingdom. Last week, they had the number one hit on the Billboard Hot 100, and it was titled Something Just Like This, and it was them with Coldplay, another group. The number two last week was That's What I Like with Bruno Mars. The number three, It Ain't Me with Kygo and Selena Gomez. But Billboard not only tracks the top 100 hits pop music, they track all kinds of genres. And it's very rare that a gospel song crosses over into the top 100 pop hits, although it happens occasionally. It happened in 1969, you won't remember, <laughs> but, and some of you won't either, but many of you will. <laughs> it was a song called Oh Happy Day by the Edwin Hawkins singers. It reached number three on the Billboard Top 100 singles chart. And then in 1971, we'll gather a few more of us, although Mike, you're not old enough to remember it then either. Uh, put your hand in the hand of the man who stills the water. Yeah, see, I can tell who's there. <laughs> who stills the waters. And that was by Ocean, and it peaked at number two on the same chart. But only one gospel hit has ever made it to number one. Can you guess what it is? Now, for a more than more of you, it won't be remembered as that because it was in 1958, April, but it was the song that brings the, gives the title to our message this morning. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. It was recorded by a young British boy named Laurie London. And he was only 14 at the time. 
April 1958. His rendition of that song reached number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart and remained there four weeks. It was the most successful record by a British male in the 1950s. Now the Beatles took that over a little later. It sold over a million copies. It was awarded a gold disc by the Record Industry Association of America that same year. And for all that, and though London went on to make other recordings, he's got the whole world in his hands, was his only hit record, like a number of groups. It's perhaps ironic that a Brit would have the breakthrough on that song because it's a song with U.S. roots. Depending on what origin story you like, it either rose from the slave fields of the American South or it was written by a certain O.B. Philpot during his service in the U.S. military during World War II. He died in 2013 at the age of 91. One source says he was a full-blooded Cherokee. But then, Rodin's sculpture, The Hand of God, which we get to see up here. Sorry, guys. We'll show it to you later. But Rodin's sculpture, The Hand of God, is amazing. When you think that it was carved out of stone, and that smooth, and there it is, the hand of God. It says something about the creative communion between God and humankind. God's hand is massive and strong. There's a sense in which that hand has ultimate control. For 13.7 billion years, that hand has shaped creation and us as part of it. Reformed theologians call this sovereignty of, the sovereignty of God, and it is seen in that extraordinary beauty that permeates creation. But there's another side to that sculpture. And the other side, the creature formed by the hand of God seems almost alive. Fetal, in the womb, still developing. As though the human life shifts and moves within the hand of God, and as it does, the hand which holds this creature adjusts and shapes it as the creature develops and shapes itself. But the question for us today is this. Do you believe God has the whole world in his hands? Some might reply, well, of course, preacher, that's why I'm here today. But others might say, yes, I'm here, but sometimes I'm not so sure. There's so much trouble and pain in the world, including in my corner of the world, as we just experienced this, this last week with the Cerna family, as we experience in the headlines, storms across Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas. As we see in some of the heinous things that war brings to cultures around our world, sometimes it seems as if nobody has the world in his hands. So I want to leave that for a minute. We'll get back to it, but let's look at our scripture. The book of Acts is partly a story of the birthday of the church, chapter 2. But then as we get into the primary information in the book of Acts is about Paul's missionary journeys, the spreading of the gospel throughout the then known world. As we follow Paul on this particular missionary journey, we learn that he's traveled far, he stirred up trouble with his preaching nearly wherever he went, sometimes in requiring a late-night departure under the cover of darkness. He's changed his team, just recently changed his team from Paul and Barnabas to now Paul and Silas and Timothy. He's been preaching for several days in Athens, in the synagogue and in the marketplace, while he waits for 
Silas and Timothy to join him so they can continue. And in his wandering and around the city and preaching in that cosmopolitan center of the world at that time, he's come to the attention of a group of philosophers who invite him to attend a regular meeting of the town's leading philosophers. He's noticed in his meanderings in, around Athens that there are many altars to idols with names. And he's come across, some scholars think more than one, but the scripture tells us about a particular one that he came to, that the inscription on the altar was to an unknown God. Now, the Athenians were wanting to cover all the bases, and they thought, well, maybe we missed somebody, and we don't want to be at, at we don't want that God to be angry with us, so we'll put this altar here so we can come and offer something to this God. Well, Paul uses that as a springboard for his discussion with them that day. He viewed that altar as a sign of a human need to worship God. And he said, in effect, to those gatherers, this altar shows you that the yearning to worship, that you're yearning to worship, but you don't know who to worship. He proceeded to introduce them to the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jesus, to tell them about the God of heaven and earth who made the world and everything and everyone in it. He even quoted two of their own poets in the passage that Chris read so well for us this morning. We think it's originated with Scripture, but it really is a Greek poet maybe 2,000 years before. In him we live and move and have our being. We always refer it to to God, the God we know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jesus. But the Greeks were familiar with that phrase. In him we live and move and have our being. And another poet they had, that we are his offspring. That again was a poem with which they were aware and familiar. And so he took that, those two phrases and said, and those guys are talking about this God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jesus. In saying this, Paul was asserting that not only his own life, but also the lives of the Athenians and the lives of Coloradans and the lives of all human beings were in God's hands, as per Rodin. It's just another way of saying he's got the whole world in his hands. And perhaps we understand that intuitively because there's something in our hearts that wants to connect with something or someone bigger than we are. But let's think about what it would be like if the Apostle Paul were to show up in the U.S. May 21, 2017. What might he say to us about this? And rather than coming to Colorado Springs, let's put him down in Times Square. And he gets a chance to walk around Times Square and around New York City and see some of the wonders there, some of the great things and some of the not-so-great things about New York. And then he comes to Starbucks. He goes in the door and he starts handing out mocha lattes to anybody who wants them who's signing up. And he says these things. Instead of speaking of temples to unknown gods, he might say something like this. I've observed how many of you are fond of saying, I'm spiritual but not religious. I'm aware how increasing numbers of you never cross the threshold of a church or synagogue or even a mosque, but spend hours browsing religious books at Barnes & Noble or Amazon. Many of you wear crosses around your necks but hardly know why. You finger them 
in moments of fear or anxiety and feel vaguely comforted. You sit at home channel surfing the televangelists and religious talk shows hoping to glean some kind of spiritual comfort for yourselves. But you don't linger long enough to really submit yourselves to their teachings. You have an insistent curiosity about things religious and vow that one day you will do something about it. But somehow you never quite find the time. Every culture that I've ever known about or read about or heard about has a religion that's very, very important to that culture. The concept of a god or gods, some that need to be appeased, some that are feared, and they're all worshipped because of the mystery of life. The religious or spiritual impulse is a significant clue to the reality of God in our world and God's sovereignty over it. In varying degrees, most of us have that same hunger, although we may be more aware of it at some times and seasons of our life more than at others. When there's a crisis, when there's a struggle, when there's pain or suffering. We may not have pursued it, but the will to believe, as William James talks about it, can help us know who it is that has the whole world in his hands. I offer some things to consider. There really is no proof, un- incontrovertible proof, whatsoever, one way or the other. God exists or God doesn't exist. When I was in college, there was a big a book and a big movement, the God is dead movement. It's faded into history. Some still espouse that. We can't prove it. We can't prove or disprove that God has the whole world in his hands. It's not just that kind of conversation, although such discussions can be interesting and perhaps for some even persuasive. Ultimately, even if you were Billy Graham, there's just no proof scientific that holds up under the scrutiny of the rules of evidence. So, what we know, we know by faith. Now, some say that's a very weak position. The affirmation that God has the whole world in his hands is a conclusion reached by faith, not by data. As science understands data and evidence, But that doesn't make the conclusion less reasonable. Frank Schaeffer in his book, Crazy for God, points out that whether we are secular or religious, we all make our biggest life-shaping decisions by faith. He said, you have to live a lifetime. You'd have to live a lifetime to be qualified for some of the decisions that, we have to, that we're forced to make earlier in our lives. Since we can't do that, live a lifetime before we make the decision, we make a leap of faith when it comes to what we should believe in, such as who we should marry, what our careers are going to be. He goes on to say, Who we happen to meet, one conversation when you were 18, the college course you happened to sign up for, the teacher you liked, the elevator you missed, and the girl or guy you met, and the next one can sometimes decide our whole lives. It's not based on rational evidence. It's by faith that we make these choices. Sometimes they work out, sometimes they don't. Only the trivialities, he says, Things like buying cars and houses and washing machines or airline seats are chosen on the basis of good information and sometimes that's not as good as you wish it was. 
I've always known I like aisle seats, but what does one really want or know what they want in a spouse at age 19 or 20 or 25 or 65? What do we know? So trusting God then is a choice we make. Choosing a spouse, believing in God, there's there's a huge leap of faith involved, well, at least in choosing a spouse, let's say. Not so much believing in God, because we know when it comes down to that, is that trusting God is a choice. Mature faith is not so much a feeling as it is a decision. We'll always have enough evidence to make a leap of faith as well as not to make that leap. One way or the other. It's a choice. It's a choice we make. And the fourth and final thing to consider is that it's not about overcoming doubt or having all the questions answered before you choose. Even Jesus, on the most difficult day of his life, had doubt. As evidenced in one of the seven words from the cross, when he shouts, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Doubts. He wondered. And it's at that horrific moment in his brief life that I find hope for me. I've learned more times than I can count that it's not about what I can prove scientifically about God. It's about knowing or having a conviction that the ultimate answers to life are known by God and only by God. Doubt is part of life. Jesus had doubts, it seems to me, but he still called out to the God he doubted was there. How many times have I done that? How many times have you done that? Yes, we can know a lot, we can understand, we can come to terms with, we can accept a lot, but ultimate, full, all-comprehending knowledge is beyond our pay grade, as they used to say in the army. It's beyond our pay grade. We live on a need-to-know basis, and we've got to be comfortable with that. Some things are for God, and for God alone to know. But our conviction, that he's got the whole world in his hands is totally plausible and rational, a belief that springs from the very core of our being. We know that as the apostle reminds us in this text, in him we live and move and have our very being. Lord knows there are so many struggles and crises in our lives that we sometimes feel nobody has the whole world in their hands. Nobody's at the wheel. We have so many questions that we often seem to be wandering in circles. The final verse of chapter 17, which Chris didn't read, is not part of the text, but I think it gives us some light to something else. In part, reads this way. When they heard of the resurrection, some scoffed, but others said, Hmm, very interesting. We'd like to hear more about this someday. We'll get back to you. That seems to be a non-response to me. It appears they went away and never got back to Paul because I've never seen it. Have you? A letter from Paul to the church at Athens? Never. It appears to me that they went away. And never came back. So what's your response today? 
If your response is yes, I believe God's got the whole world in his hands, then there's work for you and me to do. There are hungry people who need to be fed. There are injustices that need to be remedied. There are homeless people who need housing. There are people whose lives scream out to us. I want a friend. I want a friend. How will you answer both the question and the call? Amen.